So we'll, uh, can you hear me all right? Test one, two. Can you hear me back? One, two, test, one, two. We'll get started in about two or three minutes, I'm guessing, so a little bit late. We're still waiting for a few people. Uh, there's a zip file here with a uh, HTML file in it, which is my recommendation for what you use to read and then type into your own interactive prompt or Jupyter Notebook. Um, and there's, uh, there are also the I, there are also IPython notebooks or Jupyter Notebooks if you want to use. Uh, one for each section and then one, one big one. <clears throat> Uh, while we're waiting to get started, I'll do a little survey. How many of you have been using Python for more than five years? Uh, let me rephrase that. Five years full-time equivalent. More than five years. Three, more than three years. Two years or more. Uh, less than two years would be the rest of you. How about less than one year? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, you only gave them one. I wanted one of each color. I'm going to try software carpentry when they do their uh, when they do their workshops. They, I'm trying this technique today, which is you get a you get a yellow and a and a purple. Yellow means caution. I have trouble. I'm not figuring something out. Come help me. I don't have red. Sorry. And purple means hey, purple is good. I'm good to go. I finished my exercises already. <clears throat> so the, the pattern, and I'm, I'm not starting yet, I'm just sort of talking about what I'm going to teach. Uh, so the pattern is I'm going to show you some stuff and talk about it. You're going to get tired of me talking maybe. And then I'm going to uh, give you a chance, a few minutes to do some exercises. And when you're doing your exercises, you probably won't finish because I, if I wait for everyone to finish, we'll be here all day. Um, and I'm going to go through them afterwards anyway, so you don't, you don't feel you need to finish. But it gives you a chance, it gives you, the exercises give you a break from me. They give you a chance to think a different way about it, use your fingers and type and think about what's going on. Sometimes you learn a few things. I don't think there are any errors in the exercises. I've tried very hard to get them all out. Um, so if there is an error, it's because I want you to figure something out from that. Um, and the exercises start easy and get hard, so hopefully no one will finish them. Hopefully, when people are getting close, then I'll say, okay, let's move on, when about half people are done. Yes? Yep, you bet. If you have some, go for it, and I've got some here. <clears throat> Who needs a presentation? So this one for sure has, well, you see what's on it. I'm trying to remember. I think I've got both of the files on there. Python epiphanies all. So this one's got the PDF. If you want the uh, notebooks, you can get them later. Or PDF is, is what I'm recommending. Like if you get the notebook, then you're going to be tempted to just hit enter, 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 and you're not going to learn as much. And I, it's really easy to type. I mean, I'm nice and short, most of them. Let me see what I got on this one. That's right. Don't take my family pictures. I, I didn't plan, so it's got a few other things on there. I mean, this is nothing confidential, but it's uh, just the uh, Python Epiphanies PDF is what I'd like you to grab. How many people still need? The handout? Okay. You mind putting it on there? Mine's not. Uh,
So while the uh, USB stick or one or two, and if you have your own, feel free to make a copy and hand it to some other folks. Uh, uh, I can try. My system was complaining about the last one I put in. I don't know why. <coughs> Okay, so I'll start, uh, I'll go ahead and get started. The first part, you don't need the handouts, only when we get to the exercises. Uh, this course material I developed, uh, I've been teaching uh, Python courses at PyCon and other places uh, part-time, not, it's not my full-time job, but I do it occasionally. I used to teach uh, more than that um, for a while. And I, uh, this is information or pieces of uh, material I've collected that I think help people get past their their plateau, like they're using, learning Python, getting pretty good, and they're kind of like, okay, I thought I was starting to understand this language and I'm not getting it. And you read this in the introduction, or the description, that's why you signed up for the course, maybe. Um, and uh, so my goal here is, is a few things. One is to uh, do a little bit of a reset in terms of how you think about the way Python works. Um, and I, I recognize a couple of people that were in my immersion course this morning, so there'll be some repetition there. Basically helping you to think uh, the way I think you should think about how Python works, as opposed to the way you might have learned it from other languages. Um, <clears throat> if you, uh, how many of you who uh, have programmed in some other language longer than Python? And what are those languages? Java? C++? Raise your hand. Java? C++? What else? R? Script as in Bash? Something like that. JavaScript? Sorry. Perl? Okay, so some of those languages will have different ways to work. Most of those will have slightly different semantics in terms of how namespaces work. And so one of the things I'll focus on in namespaces. Um, and I'm just gonna help you understand, um, like, like if you are working at this layer of technology and you know nothing about the layer below, it makes it hard. And so I'm gonna dip down and show you a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes in Python without showing any C code, which Python's written in. I'm just gonna show you stuff you can do in Python um, to figure out what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, and hopefully we'll have some fun along the way, or at least I think, I, I know I will, I hope you will too. If I have fun and you don't, that would be a problem. <clears throat> that would be what I tell my children, it's called stealing fun, it's not appropriate. Fun at someone else's expense. <clears throat> um, when you do the, uh, it's mostly one-liners or not too much more than one-liners. I'm using Python 3.5. Uh, if you use Python 2, there'll be a few weird things. Uh, you should hurry up and switch, it's a newer Python. Um, anything else? No, I think that's everything I need to tell you to give you sort of a heads up. So let me uh, start with the first section <clears throat> and get the rhythm going here. Uh, you probably can't see the bottom row from the back very easily, right? So I think it would be better if I would shorten the bottom of that. Does that make sense? Who, like, can you read that bottom line? Yeah. yeah, everyone okay? You know, no one's ducking heads too much to see it? Let's try the first section. At the end of that, I'll get a vote and I can, I can bring the whole screen, the bottom of the screen up. It shrinks how much we see at once, but you'll be able to see a little bit better. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start really slow the first 10 or 20 minutes. It's gonna, it's gonna feel like, this is the wrong tutorial. It might feel like that. Like I'm gonna go really slow just to make sure that we understand exactly what's going on. Because it's, it's important to understand exactly what's going on with the language. Um, I think, I think it really helps people. Um, so first of all, you can create objects with literals, and I'm just gonna show you this, right? Okay, and now I'm gonna get really slow here. <clears throat> so what happens, Python sees the digit one, and it goes off and says, ah, I can, I can create, that's an integer literal, I recognize that. I will go create a brand new object, which is huge relative to the size of an int, and it's gonna represent the number one, uh, the integer one. Then, because I entered this uh, here, it's going to then uh, the IPython, which is running in this Jupyter Notebook, is gonna say, oh, okay, I got, um, it's like the read eval print loop, it's gonna show you, try to show you a text representation or a string representation on the output of what that object is. 
Okay, and if you're doing that in the, you can do this in, in the Jupyter Notebook or in, in uh, REPL, that's fine. So anyway, you can create objects. Everything in Python is an object. You can create them via literals, like floats and uh, strings and compounds, a bytes literal, which is different from a string. Remember, a string is a, a high level representation that can include Unicode characters or, or representations of Unicode characters, you might say. Uh, whereas a bytes literal is a uh, string, uh, is a series of one character, sorry, of one byte values, which is like an encoding of a Unicode, like a UTF-8 encoding perhaps, or ASCII encoding of the same thing. And you can't mix and match them. That's a change in Python 3 that's a good one. Um, tuples, lists, dictionary sets, these are all objects you can just create by putting in the, the literal and Python figures out what to do. Uh, some constants exist already at startup, for example, false and true, none. Now, when I hit enter here, what are you going to see? Nothing, because none is kind of this empty value, and when you print the string representation of none, it's nothing. It, it doesn't show. Um, and then some weird ones like that. Uh, some built-in functions, right? So what's happening in all of these cases is, I'm going to slow down again here, is Python sees a name, in this case a name, comma, a name, so it's an uh, implicit t uh, tuple, and it looks up that name in its current namespace or in closing namespaces. If it's at the global, it looks in the built-ins after looking at the, the, the main one. And then it gets back an object. If it finds it in the namespace, it gets back the object, and then it shows the representation of that object. All right. Uh, so <clears throat> int and list are some built-in types. Any and len are some built-ins. More formally, everything in Python, at runtime at least, is an object. It has a single value. It has a single type, a number of some attributes, one or more base classes, multi-inheritance, so it might have more than one. Uh, sorry, it might inherit from, it can have more than one even if it's not multiply inheritant, but it can pull from multiple. A single unique ID, which isn't that important, but we'll look at it a little bit. And then it has names, and those names are kind of like post-its on an object, right? It's, it's not, some of you coming from other languages, you might have the old model that you learned in school long ago, perhaps, or maybe not so long ago, perhaps, or maybe you didn't. But, but the idea that in most languages, in a compiled language, for example, in C, the compiler goes through, you declare a variable, the compiler saves a chunk of memory, right? And I'll ignore whether it's register or somewhere else or on the stack, it's just a, it's a box. And then you initialize that variable, it puts a value in there. And so it's like a 64-bit int, box gets a certain number of bits put into it that represent the number. And then when you issue an and then when you do something like say multiply that number by two, the compiler figures out to issue an integer multiplication with a constant two, and it changes the bits in that box so it's now four instead of two. Or I can't remember if that's what I said, but you know if it's two times two, it'll become four in that box. That's not at all what's going on in Python. In Python, uh, I say, give me the integer one, it goes off and creates an object up in memory, and then it gives you a name that refers to that object, and that name is dynamically bound to the object. It's not at compile time, it's, it's dynamic, uh, or the parts of it are. I mean, it, it gets set up during the compilation phase, but the name is referring to the object. And if I say, uh, you know, if I say i equals one, and then I say i equals two, well, the name is, it, it's not changing the one into a two, it's just changing the reference and point somewhere else. Oh, go look at the number two now. Or, thinking from the object side, it's saying here's an object one and here's an object two. I equals one puts a post-it on here and the label is I. And I say I equals two, it says, oh, let me move that label over to the object two. So very different ways of thinking. <clears throat> uh, and we'll, we'll look at some of that with the names. So let's look at these. Every object has a single type, such as int or float or complex or str or bytes or tuple or dict or set. Right? And none's kind of cool, it's its own type. <laughs> uh, some number of attributes, attributes you get out with dot notation, like dunder doc. We call that dunder, in case you didn't know that, double underscore, double underscore, it's pronounced dunder, so dunder doc. Dunder add, so that's a method wrapper. We've got this string, the dunder add is a method wrapper. Interesting. <clears throat> uh, is that thing callable? Yes, let's try to call it and it adds, it creates a new string with that new character on the end. Uh, you notice I'm talking about callable rather than function because there are lots of things you can call in Python that aren't functions, strictly speaking, but they act like them. You can call them and they return a value. Every object has one or more base classes. You can get at them, actually. If you look at an object, every object has a Dunder class 
attribute. And that attribute object, the object that's in Dunder class, has a bases attribute, which is the plural of base, like a base class. And that, if you look at just the zeroth one of it, it itself has a base class, right? So, in other words, true is an instance of bool, which is a subclass of int, which is a subclass of object. Uh, and this is in the, uh, the class hierarchy is stored in the method resolution order, which is there. Or you can just use the get MRO, uh-oh, error, danger. Uh, so in the inspect module, you pass it apparently not an instance of an object. Oh, return to, where does it say it? Bool object has no attribute MRO. Right, it's because bool's type has the MRO. So what we need to do is pass the type. So MRO takes a type and tells you what the uh, hierarchy is, roughly, right? Int object, string object. <coughs> and then we've got these memory addresses. In C Python, it's, it is a memory address. Sorry, we have IDs. IDs are unique identifiers. Every object has unique identifiers, so two objects won't share the same identifier. Uh, some implementations of Python, the identifiers will change over time. They might, like PyPy, I understand does that. I haven't seen it myself, but that's what I'm told. Uh, C Python, I think they'll stay the same, but you might have two objects you think are the same, but they're actually two different copies of a immutable. A um, bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes that you shouldn't, you should try not to worry about. I think the only time you really need ID is if you're interfacing with some external library and you actually need to get the memory reference to tell it to go poke around. Um, there's some odd edge cases. So don't worry about ID very much, but these all have locations. The next way you can call, create objects is calling other objects, right? So here's a name that's built in. It's a function. It is callable. We can call it. And it went off to the string or the string class and checked to see if it had a dunder len method and called that passing, uh, and it, it then, the, sorry, the string object got created, passed off to whatever len referred to, which is an object, happens to be a function. It goes and checks to see if the object has a dunder len. If not, well, then it, it, it calls it basically and figures out what, how long the thing is. And then it returns a new object, which is the 16. Are you getting tired of me saying object? Like there are a lot of objects flying around in Python all the time. We'll, we'll count some of them later. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> all right, so we could, uh, we could bypass the correct way of doing it and just sort of call them directly if we wanted. Int is callable, dict is callable, gives you an empty that all these, you can call dict, I think you've probably all seen that already, you can use keyword parameters. True is not callable, and it will complain if you try, it's not callable. Okay, I wasn't listening. <coughs> uh, bool, like most of the types, when you call a type with uh, no arguments, it typically returns sort of the base case, or the zero value, or the empty value. So, uh, just to get the rhythm down here, now you get to do a few exercises, and here's some things I've already told you. Uh, when you have a question, put a yellow post-it on your screen. That means come help me, or, I'll, or just raise your hand, that's fine too. And when you're done the exercise, go ahead and put the purple up. If I start to see a couple purples, we'll move on then already. So most of you won't finish the exercises, that's completely normal. It doesn't mean you're slow. It means I'm trying to give you a lot of material and you can do the rest of it afterwards. Okay, any questions? Okay, go ahead, do the exercises. Anyone still need handouts?
Okay, I think uh, most of you have done at least some of the exercises. Um, so, sorry I wasn't as clear as I should have, could have been. Uh, so, what I want you to do is, you've got an HTML file, open up that and open up an interactive prompt or a notebook, and then type into the notebook or the interactive prompt the stuff that I've got here, and try to predict ahead of time what it's gonna do. The exercises are for you, so, so do what makes sense, right? I think it's useful for you to type all of them or most of them yourself. Uh, if you want to paste, copy and paste instead, that's okay. I think you won't learn quite as much. Um, if you want to skip some, because you're like, oh, I know that one already, I'm sure. We'll skip down to later ones if you want, um, towards the harder ones. Um, and some of them, you, you might think you know what it's going to do, but it won't. So try really hard to predict what it's going to do. So I'm going to go through them now and show you what, uh, what they do. Um, and occasionally, like I'm running Python 3.5. If you're running Python 3 before 3.5, I think everything but two lines will work. If you're running 2.7, there'll be a good five or 10 percent that'll do slightly different things. Uh, oh, so there's a, I created an integer, oh, sorry, a float object, and then I looked at all its attributes. There are lots and lots of them. Um, and method wrapper, it's callable. I can call, oh, I can't call it like that. So it requires one argument, right? So dunder add is just what implements plus with a, with a float. So if you say 5.0 plus something, well, this dunder add is what actually gets called. And the way it gets called is it gets past the other object. How about this one? What's going on here? Well, this is showing you how dot means more than one thing in Python. It means separate the digits between the you know, left and right side of a floating point number. It also means attribute access. And it, it thought I meant the other one or something. Um, and I'm not showing you this to show, say that Python's awful. Python has a few corners where the syntax collides uh, because uh, the same thing is used multiple places. Be aware of them, move on. Um, <clears throat> and in some cases, there are even some weirder things that uh, in theory, you could, they could be fi fixed in the language, but it would be at huge cost in terms of not only development effort, but performance sometimes. So uh, Python's a practical language. Put parentheses around it, fix that small problem. Right? And we can, you know, call add. So let's see how big these things are, right? 50 bytes for a four character. No, that's not quite the right term. Well, maybe it is. Does Unicode string have characters? I'd say that's okay to, to say that, uh, even if they're not one-byte characters, necessarily. Uh, so most of it is, uh, sorry, W has 50, walk has 53. So you can see there's an overhead of about 49 uh, <clears throat> bytes of information, storing information about the string, as in the string object. Size of two. You notice that uh, you can get pretty big with these integers in Python. Uh, there, I don't think there's a, I was talking with someone about this. Is there any limit to how big an integer can be in Python? Uh, not counting money, running out of memory, and I guess running out of address space, maybe. Um, okay, any questions about the exercises? Yes? So the different numbers would be due to Python 2 at least? Or is one of them smaller? Yeah, they'd be different. Or, or possibly 32-bit versus 64-bit. I assume 64-bit, I don't know. Okay. Uh, no, that would be Unicode versus STR, I think, I'm pretty sure. Like, like string in Python 2, by default, quote, uh, an apostrophe around some characters defines a string, and the string in Python 2 is single one byte per character. Uh, in Python 3, the closest data type is the bytes data type, which is one byte per per byte, <laughs> but they're, they're not characters. Um, and then to turn those into Unicode, you can convert back and forth, encode, decode, but Unicode strings in Python 3, uh, I don't remember how they're stored, and it's even changed in some of the versions of 3, uh, some of the details of it, but they're, they're stored in some encoding that isn't our business, really. Like how Python stores the string in memory, we shouldn't worry about and we shouldn't try to think about. It's when we want to get it back to disk or on the network or something, then we choose an encoding and encode it appropriately. So if you, do a, if you put a U in front of that same string in Python 2, you'll probably get a number closer to this, would be my guess. 52, so pretty close. So it, it's basically just Unicode is in Python 3. Everything, all strings are Unicode in Python 3. Okay, let me... Uh, sorry, I don't have this uh, rhythm with the two windows very good yet. Okay. North...
So uh, the size of storing a character in Python 2 is one byte. The size of storing a string object that has a single character in it is much bigger. And that's, that's part of the point I'm trying to make here. Is like, like an integer 1 or 17, like how many bytes does it take to store that? Whereas the integer object is huge, right? And that's, it's just helping to reinforce that we're, we're, we're dealing with objects here. We're not dealing with the stuff down below. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so let's look at names in a little bit more detail. Uh, and again, this, this one's also a little bit slow maybe, but uh, we'll, we'll get going faster soon. So namespaces are very much like dictionaries. So if I do a dir in this Jupyter Notebook, it goes on and on, lots of stuff. So I'm going to make this little fake thing here. Let me just write it and load it. Oops, sorry. And then I can do a dir n, and it makes it a little bit easier to read. All right, so now I have an empty dictionary. Think about a namespace like a dictionary. It's key value pairs, right? A regular dictionary, you, use, you can put a string in as the key and the object, and, and have any object as the value. Um, in a namespace, you don't have to put the quotes around the string. The string has to be a valid Python identifier, and the value you only get out by referencing using the key, and then it just automatically gives you the name. So, uh, sorry, the value, which is the object it references. So in this first line, A, if I try to access a name that's not in the namespace, I get a name error, right? It's not defined. If I say A equals 300, I'm going to slow down again. What happens here is Python sees the 300, goes off and creates an integer object that represents that. It sees the A equal, and this is a simple thing on the left side, it's no square brackets or anything else. And it says, okay, I'm going to bind the name A to the object 300. I'm going to create a new L entry in the current namespace, which is the identifier A. And I'm going to make the A reference the 300, right? So I'm not initializing a variable with assignment. I'm not putting something in a box. I'm just adding a new, I created a new object, and I added a new name to the current namespace. Assignment, simple assignment is a namespace operation. And if I look at what's in my current namespace now, ignoring the fluff I got rid of, with my little helper function, I've got a key value pair, right? The name, 300. And now when I try to access A, of course, I get back the value. That's how you get the, the values back. Uh, so I'm trying not to use the word variable because it has a lot of baggage meaning with a lot of people. Um, and there are, people will argue either way, does it, uh, Okay, does it um, <clears throat> have variables or not? Well, it does in some sense, in other ways it doesn't quite. So if I say A equals 400, that's going to rebind the name, right? It's not gonna change 300 into 400. It's not gonna do anything with 300. It's just going to go create a 400 and then make A refer to the 400 instead. Will a 300 go away? None of my business. Python is garbage collected. It might if there are no more references to it. That's usually none of your business. Uh, okay, and we can see that now A is 400. B equals A, what does that do? It says make B refer to the same object that A refers to, right? And so now you can see that B is 400, A is also 400. Uh, and in fact, that line 16 is a little bit misleading because it makes it look like we've got two 400s out there. There's really just one 400 object in this case, and you can see that by saying they have the same ID. Not only are they equal, but they are the same object. So both A and B refer to the same object. Okay? Why is this thing not going away? Yeah. What's that? Uh, in C Python, the ID is the memory address. But don't worry about it. It's not something you usually need to... Like again, you're, you're programming at this level. I'm showing you a little bit about what goes on underneath so you understand it, but it's not where you need to usually think. It's just being aware of it will, I think, make you uh, do better at the, at the level you will be using Python at. Um, where was I? Oh, so A is B. Del A, what does that do? Does it delete A? Well, yeah, but what does that mean? It means it removes the name from the namespace. Does it delete the, re the object that A refers to? It depends. Depends on if it's the last reference and if it's choosing to do garbage collection right then, right? And depending on what implementation of Python. So once I've done a del A, dir n, you see that B still refers to 400, so it certainly didn't delete the 400 object. <coughs> and if I try A, I get the name error again. Good. 
Okay, uh, so of course I have B400, now I say B equals block. Well, now that you know it's, it's not a box that the compiler knows what type it is, it's just a reference to an object out there. Of course you can have A equal 400 at one moment, or sorry, B, and then have it referred to a string the next moment. That's not a problem at all. Uh, let's see, and we can see that there's nothing now that we've deleted B, there's nothing there. Uh, object attributes are kind of like dictionaries. Uh, and there are namespaces that go on in there. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll take a look at that. If you do that in Python 2, you get the same thing as I can get if I import simple namespace from types. So I'll create one of these things. And let's create some points. Let's create a point. It's got a dict, which is empty. Let's add some attributes to it. That's really bugging me. Is that bugging anyone else? I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, at the next break, I'll try to fix it. Uh, so I, sorry. So I've created these new attributes. If I look at the instance objects, as an instance of a class, if I look at its dunder dict, that's where it keeps the values. It actually keeps them right in there. And I can access them that way. So sort of like a namespace, right? I've, instead of using... A or B, I'm using X with a dot and then the P first. Uh, so here, if I say P.X equal 100, remember I said A is equal as a namespace operation? Well, not in this case. In this case, what's happening is Python sees the P, looks it up, gets an object. It sees the dot X and says, oh, you want me to ask the P object, the wherever P refers to, you want me to ask it to assign, uh, to, to bind its name X to this object. So it passes it off to the object that P refers to and says, please bind this object to your name X. So that's not, uh, so it's, it's also it's sort of, the object's doing something in its own namespace, kind of. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so here I create the list. I change that one to one and it's changed. Cool. One, two, three. So here I've done a slice operation where I said starting at from two onwards, uh, sorry, zero, one from two onwards. So from the one that's also the number two, put those in there, we get that. Uh, so remember, I've showed you what is does, but remember what it means. It means is this the same, is this name and this name, are they the same object? It does not mean are they really, really equal? And I can prove that to you. Okay, not surprising. Maybe surprising, right? So why is there different behavior here? They both say that they're equal, that A is equal to A and that AB is equal to AB. Uh, but here it says S is the same object as T. So S and T refer to the same object. Here it doesn't. And again, the short answer is it's none of my business why it's different. It has to do with the implementation of Python in this particular interpreter. Um, <clears throat> Practically speaking, it has something to do with optimization. Um, like, like these strings that are identifiers are, are, are stored only once ever, and where these ones aren't or something like that. But that, that's not, uh, I'm not going that deep, because we're not talking about why Python influence things in certain ways, or at least not too much. Um, here's another example. It's kind of interesting, right? You'd think it'd be the same, but it's not. Well, again, what matters is, is 10 equal to 10? That's what I care about. Do I care that Python storing one ten or two tens? No, it's an immutable object. If it wants to store two five hundreds, fine, go ahead. Um, if in case you're curious, though, okay, so let's uh, let's actually go look a little bit and see, because we can. So I did a little exploring and got it down to this, and you can see that right about at minus five, up to two fifty six. I missed pulled the ones out in between. Python preallocates those integers. That's why this happens to be different behavior. It's because it pre-allocates those integers. <clears throat> so, any questions on that section? Yes. I thought one of the reasons that strings are immutable was so that they could save memory by having different objects called different name points for the same object, which clearly they're not taking advantage of. Well, they're not taking advantage of for all strings, but they are for some strings, maybe. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I... I I agree. I think that's probably why I don't. I haven't dug in behind this. I don't know what the backstory is in terms of why these two are di implemented slightly differently. I believe, or I've heard, it has something to do with like valid identifiers versus ones that aren't. Beyond that, I don't know. 
someone here, mate. We can chat later. Other questions? All right. Oh, go ahead. Yep. And and that saves us time apparently. Like like obviously there's pathological cases where that's maybe going to slow your code down, but but in general it helps. And and I'll show you in a little bit uh, how many of them there are. That's kind of interesting to see. You can you can see how many how many 255s are out there already. <laughs> for example, how many references to that single number. Okay, so go spend a few uh, minutes doing the exercises.
Sorry about that. Now you can all hear me. Uh, uh, we won't go back for the benefit of the video. They're lost. <clears throat> um, sorry about that, dear video watchers. Uh, how about this? So if I do a sentinel value equals object, what that does is uh, it's useful if you need to, for example, if you go look at the source code for Funk Tools LRU cache, it uses this technique to basically create an object that's different from every other object. It's easy to do, you just instantiate object. Yes? Direct references. That's right, right? So none has a reference in it to none type, which itself has a reference to object, for example. I'm inferring that that's true, but that's why. All right, so if I create this thing, that is true. Any other value, it's not going to be equal. It's only equal to this one, to itself. Well, it might be true to another name if I add another name for it, right? Anyone figure out why there were two references to sentinel value? What's that? One in the dir function? No. Good guess. No, no, I just created one. Right there, sentinel value equals object. There is one object out there. Sentinel value is the only reference to it. But now, when refs is running, there are two references to it. Where's the other reference? No? In the refs function, right? So in refs, the refs function has a parameter. We pass whatever sentinel value resolves to, a reference to that object into the function, and suddenly there's two names, and it says here's two. And then when it's done, it's back to one, right? Uh, if you get, yeah, probably. Again, I'm, I'm inferring what's going on here. I've never looked at rest, but I'm sure this is what, you, we, right? We can figure out that must be what's going on, right? Uh, how about this one? Not that many. Not that many. Oh, less still. And let's see exactly how many there are. Well, you can see it drops off. Zero, there's lots of them. One, there's a lot. And then it drops off. And, and someone who was in the design of Python, they figured, okay, well, for an average working set of code, whatever, let's stop at 255. So that's why some are pre-allocated. Again, is it, this is not really going to help you a lot in your coding day-to-day, -day, but it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. And it is learning that you can explore Python this way helps you get comfortable with the, the stuff that lets you do things like write your own classes and meta classes and whatnot. Right? So let's design these two things. Right? Yeah, you've seen that before. Don't need a temporary to do swap. You notice that you can do uh, iterable, iterable unpacking anything on the right. The, the piece on the right can be any sequence. Could be an open file handle. Uh, you'd have to know exactly how long it is, uh, at least if you're going to name all three, but you could do that. And of course, strings are iterables, so all of those are going to do something. And you can insert, you know, check what they are, but they're going to be each of those individual elements. or or this case, and again, this one, strings are kind of confusing, right? So when we're done, we have this string of three characters, and then when we're done, we're going to have an I and a J and a K, each of those three characters. No, each of those strings of length one, right? So there's no character type in Python, there's string, and a string of one character is still a string. <clears throat> uh, in Python 3, there's some extended iterable unpacking, like this, right? And again, the parentheses here is just because I've made a tuple to show it to you all on one line. Right? So we have basically four name uh, assignments or bindings happened here, and the last one got to be this list of those values. You can put the star in the middle somewhere, and you get all the ones in the middle, which might be empty. Sorry, where was it? There. Might be empty. You can also do this in Python 3.5, I think is when it arrived. Right? So I can create a list that way that's unpacks inside here or here. Oh, I did that already, sorry. Uh, and also, I think this is new in 3.5 as well. You, can, uh, you could always do this with one argument, but now you can do it with multiple uh, sequences, iterables, or dictionaries you can put in multiple places to unpack uh, more than once at the same time. Uh, something I didn't know until related to releasing. You know, you can do del of two things at the same time. That's going to change so much of my code. <clears throat> uh, 
just kidding. And like all of these, like it's, it doesn't matter what the, the iterable is on the right side. Uh, really, I can type. And then you did that just to see what happened there. And if you were curious why it's different, this tells you why it's different. It's because it does a dupe top. Again, I'm not going to fish around too long to try to explain exactly why one is, is is true and the, the other is is false, but you can look at code behind the scenes here. And we're going to do some of that later as well. So what does refs get as an argument? It gets a reference to an object. That's right. That's right. All right, so uh, where were those? Up here somewhere, right? So. 98, 16, 99, 14. If you expand this code and go past the pre-allocated integers, you should, I assume you'll get a lot of ones or twos. Right, like a 500? Two is a literal. And Python reads the two and goes off and creates a so earlier I said creates an object representing an integer two, and I lied. This is always what happens when you're teaching, right? In grade seven, they told you one thing. Grade eight, they told you you lied. Yeah. Uh, so I lied. What happens is uh, Python goes off and makes sure that there is an object that represents the integer two, creating it if it wants to, and it returns a. And then what it, now we have is a reference to an object that represents the integer two. In this case, it went and found one that was already there. For performance reasons it's, or optimization reasons, it's not going to re recreate twos all over the place. It's just going to have the one. So it checks. When, when integer creation happens, it goes, let me see, is, is there one that's already there? Yes, there is. And so then it just returns an existing, a reference to an existing object. Good point. It'd be nice to, uh, to extend this so I can actually show what I think will happen is you'll get a lot of twos right after we hit 255. Yeah, a bunch of fours, eh? Four, why would they be four? Oh, could use the range, yep, quite possibly. Interesting, so a bunch of fours in there. Okay, um, how far did I get down here? Hmm, interesting. So if you use range, you get references of four, and X range, you get references of threes. Good to know. Okay, so here I can assign, I can delete them. Yeah, I was just showing you, you can delete more than one. Oh, I did all these already, sorry. I just didn't have output. Oh, that was the end of the section, great. Okay, so any questions on how names are working in Python? You think you'd understand them a little bit more deeply? And hopefully it's not, hopefully the, the extra confusion is worth the extra knowledge. Um, What's that? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Where was that one? Right here. Right? It's always the, 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 the one that catches them all is always a list. It might have zero elements. It might have lots. It might have one. Okay, oh, more about namespaces. Stuart, are you done yet? Okay, let's talk about namespaces a little bit more. So a namespace is a mapping for, you can know that, Just think of it like a dictionary. Simple assignment, simple del, our namespace operations. A scope is a section of Python code where a namespace is directly accessible. You're writing a function, the code in that function is accessing the namespace of that function. Uh, can you access that namespace from outside the function? Maybe, maybe not, or maybe easily, maybe not. A uh, global namespace of a module, can you access that from outside the function? Well, kind of, there's some names in it you can get at once you've imported it, but I, I would say mostly not. Yes? There's a funny thing that I noticed that happens, for example, when you, when you do a for loop, if you say for, range, for i in range i, you, you print i, um, and then 
once the loop runs, then you go ahead and, and ask it to print I again. It'll print four. Yeah, interesting. So, I, I don't know. Sorry, I in range five or I in range four? What was that? So it printed the five, so it was I in range six? Yeah, well, I in range five, whatever. Okay. And it, it'll print from zero to, 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 to yep. N minus one. Yep. And if you go to the next line after the for loop and ask it to print I, it'll print the last value that it printed. Yep. I yep. don't know if it's a debugging because they tool. No. No, no, I think that, so when you, so uh, creating a name in a namespace, there's lots of ways to do it. A for loop does it, okay. right? So now you, so it's, not, it's not like the typical global and local. Um, right. I, I know that it, in C style languages. The, when, you, when you create the I in a for loop, it goes yeah, away after the for loop. Period. That's right. In Python, that's not true for for loops. Uh, in Python, that was not true for list comprehensions, but is true now for list comprehensions. Right, so in a list comprehension, you say, you know, something for I in, and then it used to be that that would leak out is the yeah. name as well how they describe it in the documentation, and now it doesn't. They fi they fixed that, uh, but the I in the, in the for loop uh, that's been that way so long. Either it was a design choice, or they've decided enough people have started taking advantage of that because it's useful occasionally. <laughs> Yeah. The last value was that, that was printed or was put into yeah. a list? Well, I, I've written code that is, you conveniently uses that because I wanted to know where did that for loop end, like in, a, in an error situation, for example. Not quite debugging, but yep. Um, so a scope, directly accessible. For an indirectly accessible namespace, you access it via dot. Search order is innermost scope contains local names like inside a class or a function. Uh, enclosing functions starting with the nearest enclosing scope or the module if we're outside a function. Then there's module globals names and then there's the built-in name. So it goes through all these layers looking for looking, uh, looking up a name when it's trying to figure out what it refers to. Namespace change, all namespace changes happen in the local scope. Remember that, okay? Uh, here are the ones I can think of, there might be more. Oh, actually, there is. Yeah, I've already just found one talking about this little thing here. Is that uh, in a uh, list comprehension that creates a name, uh, which in the lowest newest version of Python goes away right after that. But anyway, so yeah, name del import def class names of function parameters in the for loop. The name here, which we just talked about, except clause. You put in a name, whatever you choose. So there's lots of ways to to add these names to the namespace. Um, so best practice is don't reassign built-in names, so let's do that. <coughs> All right, so what that function gonna do? It's gonna have inside the function, it's gonna print uh, whatever len, it's gonna try to display with that print statement whatever len refers to, and then it's gonna find a local function named len, and then inside the local function len, it's gonna have a new local name or variable len. Let's get to all these things. Okay, let's just see what it does. Huh, unbound local error. Okay, well, let's uh, just ignore that for a moment. We'll fix it by commenting that out. And now we'll run F2, there we go. I'm not gonna ignore that forever. I'm coming back to it. <coughs> uh, all right, so there we go. In, so we got the func in len, in F1, we call it len equals function F2 locals len. That's a long name, but it's trying to let us, you know, it's showing us where this is in there. And local len resert, okay. And then we're back outside the function. Len's back, right? All those names were done in the function. We execute it, they spring into existence, they disappear. And now we're back at the top. Uh, so that was not good practice. This is even worse practice, all right? And you can't do that with everything, but you can do it with a lot of the built-ins, right? So now len is 99, cool. So if I, I can define that function, no problem. How, how could that function even compile? Oh, right, because it only compiled, it didn't actually execute. When I execute it, how's it gonna fail? What's the error? What's not callable? Uh, the integer 99 is not callable, exactly. Int object is not callable, right? Because inside that, it got the name, it went out looking for the name, got to the global namespace of the module, which is the interactive prompt here, didn't go to the built-ins because it was shadowed or hidden. It didn't get that far. And so it got this uh, not callable, right? So let's uh, 
and you can see it's still 99. So now let's delete it. Oh no, now we've deleted the len function. No, we've deleted the local name in the module, the module global name, which is 99, referred to 99, and now we've got, we uncovered it, it's there. It's like archeology. span All right, uh, print len, good, everything is good. We're, we're happy now. Pass is a statement, can we do this? No, because it's invalid syntax. So len is a built-in, pass is a keyword. Like, so there are some differences. There's actually relatively few keywords in Python, there they are. It's kind of interesting. And then that actually may not be up to date. I think that might be an old list, so don't quote me. I think I've forgotten to update that for Python 3 uh, a few months ago. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back to what I said. So here we're gonna x equal one, and then define a function that prints it. No surprises there. It can get at it. Let's do this one. X equal two. So now we're going to name, create a name inside the function. X equal to, with X equal two. X is one. We call test local. It shows us X is two. When we get back out, X equal. Thank you. <clears throat> And then this one, we're going to do the same thing, but let's print the value of x before we do the x equal 3. x equal 1. Call the function, it should print x equal 1 and then assign it to x equal 3. But instead we get this unbound local error. Local variable x is referenced before assignment. Right? So some of you have seen this and went, what in the world? Some of you have seen it and figured it out and go read the, read the fact. Uh, it tells you why it does this. Uh, some of you will see it, and now that you've seen this, you won't get too surprised by it. What's basically going on here is that Python, when it compiles this code as part of the function definition, uh, it here sees an assignment, and you remember the rule? All assignments happen in the local namespace. So it's going to assign, uh, it's going to create a new name in the local namespace, x. And so it, it figures that out at compile time, and it's got a space ready. It says, okay, I'm gonna have a local name x. And then here, when we actually run this, when we actually execute it down here, it executes this line, and it gets that X and says, oh, X, yeah, that's a local name. I know it is, because when I compiled it, I recorded it as a local name. Except I don't know what it has. It has no value, right? Can you ever have uninitialized variables in Python? No, we don't have variables, but this is kind of close, actually. It's kind of like an uninitialized variable, the closest we'll get, I would say. All right, <laughs> well, let's uh, just double check what's going on here. Yep, X is still one. Let's see what's going on. Test unbound local. You can look at the code object that that name has hung off of it. And you can look at its code, uh, dunder code attributes, co underscore arg count. It says there are no arguments to that function. It's an argument, it's a function that takes no arguments in the signature. It knows its own name, which is kind of cool. It makes sense that it should. So its name, by the way, it knows its own name. That means that the def put this name test unbound local in two places, one in the namespace, one into the code object that the function compiled into. Okay, we'll see that later as well. Uh, and here are the names that got used in the bytecode. Oh, cool. And here's the number of locals, one, and here's its name. So when it tried, this, is, this shows you exactly what's going on. All right, and if you really want to see what's going on, we'll do another disassembly and see that we're doing a load fast right here before it got the value set in store fast. I, I'm not an expert in these byte codes, but you can pick out sort of what's going on. So, so that's why unbound locals happen. Um, and again, they, you know, could they have fixed it? Well, maybe, but what a, a lot of code and not much benefit and maybe slowed things down. Um, and here it is exactly the description, the answer to why this happens from the FAQ. Um, and explore a little bit more if you want by looking at these two. Uh, you can just do those compiles on your own if you want. Any questions on that? Okay, let's do a test global. What's this gonna do? Well, so global is a keyword that says, uh, don't make a local out of this basically, and so instead it's gonna get the global one. Uh, and so once we've done that, we'll look at X's value. It's one, we call test global, it's one, then it becomes four, and because we are accessing the global name, 
it's still four. So X in the global namespace also changed, right? So it never created a new name. So basically this tells Python to break its own rule of all namespace assignments happen in a local namespace. And uh, you can, again, go poke around here if you want, and you can see there's not even a load fast in here. There's just a load global with a lot of other stuff. Uh, Python 3 adds non-local right there. You can now use the keyword non-local, and it says don't look all the way out to the module. Look only as far as you need to go to find a name, and in this case, it's going to find the name right there. All right, so we'll define this. Print after, print before, test six, right? So test on local is going to define a function, print a value, call the function it defined in the function, print the value, and exit. So x is one. Yep. Yes. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, what? I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I'm right on that. No, I'm more than that, I'm 100% sure. But test it anyway, just to see. Because <laughs> I'm not, uh, I, I make mistakes. But yeah, that's, everything, everything I can think of says yes, that must be true. So I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, okay, so we got the X, we do the test non-local. And, oh, I already did that, sorry, and there we go. And of course, on the outside, X never changed, because it didn't go all the way out to global. Okay. What are we doing for time? PM break will be at 3 p.m. If I forget that, please remind me. <clears throat> uh, okay. Hang on a moment while I make two notes. Every time I teach material like this, I learn stuff from you, the students, and, and then I make notes so I make it better for next time. Thank you. Sure, I'll clean it up later. Uh, okay, now we've got... Four. Okay, let's look at... Import is another way to change a namespace. Let's explore it for a little bit, and then you can play with it a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to get this dir p back again. And uh, so now it looks like it's empty. All right, so if I import CSV, CSV uh, kind of, the name kind of went two places again. The module itself knows about the name and I've got this new name CSV in my current namespace as well as there's the name of a file CSV somewhere or something like a file, like it's a module that you can import. Typically it's a file, a csv.py although it can be some other things. Okay, so now if I, if I access CSV, it's now in my current namespace, and I can see module CSV, there's the other place the name got put. Although I think, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that CSV, that CSV name, no, it's probably import that does it. I'm not sure. I think it's import that actually puts that name in the module object. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter too much. If I look at what's in CSV, there's all these names. Right, and I can look, I can access these names of that module. Uh, so if I import CSV again, it's not gonna go reload that module. It's already sitting in memory. And if I reload, if I say import a second time, it says, oh yeah, I got it already, we're cool. It just gives you another name for it, or possibly another name. Like if I import it separately, we'll see that in a moment, I think. Uh, CSV.spam is not there, but I can put it there if I really want to. All right. Import from CSV import reader as CSV reader. What's that going to do? So it's going to, from CSV, it goes and said, looks for the CSV module, finds it in its cache, kind of says, oh, I've already loaded it, it's in memory, reaches inside it to get the reader attribute, and then that gets a reference to that and puts a new name in the local namespace called CSV underscore reader and refers to that thing in there, right? And so you can see those are two names for the same object. CSV is still there. CSV is still there. All right. Let's get rid of CSV as a name, but import it as a different, do the import as a different name. So now I've got CSV reader and CSV module. 
So I'm just playing around here, making sure, like all this, I'm going a little fast. If you go through it later, it should all make sense. And if it doesn't, go back and think, okay, what's exactly going on with these names? Python is all about names. <clears throat> math is not defined, right? Dir math is not going to help me. Let's make sure it's gone. Yeah, it's not there. And let's import it. So I, I told you when Python reads the code, it sees, a, it sees something like this and it tries to resolve that name, right? It goes and looks in the namespace to find it. But when it's an import, it doesn't, right? Because math is not defined. So why didn't import give us a name error? It's because import it triggers slightly different code than a regular lookup, right? Import is a statement, and this string, this identifier here is sent off as a string to import, and it does the right things, and then puts import into the, uh, sorry, puts math into the name, right? Because math by itself, now it works. <clears throat> whereas before it didn't. So at this point, just to, just to make it really clear, at this point, math did not refer to the math module. It was just an identifier that was undefined. Import made it be defined. All right, All right so let's uh, get rid of that. Uh, maybe we don't know it till runtime. Well, you can do some fancy things like this, right? Import, import lib, and I can do that, right? So now I've got this, now I've imported that module. Can I do math by now? No, because import lib returns the module object. It doesn't change the name. Uh, it doesn't change the current namespace. It does not insert any name into the current namespace. If I want to do that, I do it myself. So just take that same thing, prefix it with the math underscore module equals. And of course, math.py is still going to fail because I didn't call it math.py when I did the assignment of the name here. I called it math underscore module, right? This will work, though. If I say module name equal math, right? Maybe I don't, maybe this is input or determined dynamically or something in an if statement, right? So now that module name equals math, now if I import module name, that'll pull in math, right? No, it's gonna look for the module called module name and it's not gonna find it, right? Oh, right, because it takes an identifier which, okay. So I can do it this way, right? No, that's a syntax error. You have to give it not a string, but the actual module name yourself. Okay, so uh, take a few minutes and play with imports yourself as well. And if you're using Python 2, you'll see the reload function in the import module. Python 2 has it built in. It's uh, one of the built-ins. It's not hidden away in a module. Okay, I'm going to move us along. This is a pretty short little section. <clears throat> These are fairly straightforward. 
modules have some things in there. Oh, there's CSV dunder name that gets added to the module object. Uh, import reload, del CSV. Oh, so here you can see something similar going on, right? So what, what's, if, you're, if you're clear on what's happening with names and namespace changes and stuff, once I've removed the name CSV from my namespace, then when I do an import live reload, reload takes, uh, well, it says name CSV is not defined, right? So it's trying to look up the name CSV. It's not there anymore. So I'll just pass in the string, and then it'll complain and say, no, 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 you have to pass me a module object itself. So I have to import it again to get the name back. Then I can, no, no, I can't send the string. I got to give it the module itself here. So CSV here is the name that refers to the module object. Well, then you can do the import, okay? And this is where it gets stuff from. Okay, any questions on that? It's amazing how, uh, okay, let's grab this one. Functions. Before I talk about functions, uh, actually, I'm not going to, uh, sorry, this name is not very correct. There are two sections I'm skipping that had more to do with functions, but they're fairly simple. What I'm going to do is look at augmented assignment statements a little bit. So let's create two names, S1 and S2. Augmented, well, you'll understand briefly, shortly. Any questions? Sorry, did I go too fast? Any questions yet? Okay. <clears throat> so S1 is S2, as we know is correct, and these both have well, one, two, three is the value. So now I'm going to do S2 equal S2 plus four and see what we get. We get that we have two different strings now, right? You understand what's going on with the names. Reassigns the second name, so it's bound to two object. Okay. Let's do the same thing with two lists. Very similar code. Right, almost the same. So now if you want... As I go to the next section, you might look back at the previous section if you have it on your screen and see. I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to change the. I'm going to change the spam equals spam plus something foo or whatever to use plus equal, which is the augmented assignment uh, statement. I think that's what it's called. Somehow, sorry, I'm having second thoughts that I got that name right. I'm trust myself. I wrote it down. Okay, uh, so. Create the two strings, S2 plus equal 4, then is S1 going to equal S2? No, S1 and S2 are going to be different strings as well. Okay, but now what happens? If I do two lists, M2 plus equal 4, uh, so why are strings and lists different? Why are they behaving? Like, like you'd think these are about the same, but they don't seem like they're doing the same, right? In this case, when I said M2 plus, here, here S2 plus equal four changed S2, didn't change S1. Here it did change the list that both M1 and M2 referred to. So this changed what S2 referred to. This one didn't, it just changed what they both referred to, actually changed the object itself. Well, the reason it can do that is because lists are mutable and strings are not. But I think that's not quite a deep enough answer. What's really going on is that plus equal is not the same as equal and a plus one separately, right? If you read the documentation, it clearly, it's, it's actually a different operation. And we can prove that. I think this might be the last time we do some disassembly. So if you're loving it, enjoy it while you can. <coughs> right, so binary add, in place add. Right? So it's a different operation. Let's look at it a little closer here. So there's M2. M2.iAd. That's actually the method that implements implement, uh, the in place add. Right? So it returned the list and it changed the list. Okay, how about this one? Oh, okay. So what's going on is described right here is that 
if a method has in place add, the documentation says how it's supposed to try, what it should try to do and how it's supposed to behave. And it also says if that method is missing, then Python will insert the code to make it work. So when I said it's, it's not just, here I lied again, eh? it's not just syntactic sugar. The answer is it's not just syntactic sugar unless the I add method is missing, the dunder I add method is missing, and then Python will insert the syntactic sugar. So once again, I lied to you. Um, but that's what's going on, right? So here's, you can see it finds I add, and so instead it calls add, reassigns it, et cetera, okay? Uh, here's some uh, more surprising behavior, which is one of the Python warts that's kind of interesting to think about. And again, uh, not because I want to make fun of Python. I like Python, but it, it helps us think through what's really going on, right? So here's a tuple. And uh, I'm going to survey again. How many of you say tuple versus tuple? Tuple, raise your hand. Tuple, raise your hand. Yeah, I think it's a Canadian US thing. I taught this last week in Toronto, and I saw people there, and they all, they all, almost everyone said tuple, except me. I was saying tuple. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So. Okay. T sub. All right. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, I want to make seven change to an eight. Not literally change, but I want to do an in place add, whatever that means, right? Uh, and it didn't work. Right? Well, it's, in fact, I can't even do that, which is what it might fall back on, you'd think, right? And it can't because tuple object does not support assignment. Okay. Let's make a list instead. No, sorry. Let's, yes. Um, I would have thought that it would say that int object is not supported by assignment. If you were uh, here, you mean? Yeah, oh, even here, you'd think it would have, eh? So uh, what's happening here is, uh, so what happens here is T1 sub zero, because it's, uh, I, I think I'm getting this right. If it were an assignment for sure, let's look at this one. What's happening here is T1 sub zero is, it's a, this becomes a request of the object that T1 refers to, to do an assignment of its element at index zero. That one makes sense, right? Or do you, you see what I said? Like that's the way, like, like simple assignment is a namespace operation. This is not a namespace operation. This is a request sent to the object that T1 refers to, the tuple, telling it, basically giving it, uh, it's probably calling its dunder set item, right? Saying, let me call your dunder set item method and here's uh, the index element zero and here's the value it should have, which is, like this clearly works, right? This you can do. You create, well, I can't remember what the number was. Like that, that resolves to eight, that evaluates to an integer eight. So it's basically saying T1 set item zero eight, saying set zero to be eight, set index zero to be eight. Uh, so, so that makes sense to why this would not, why this doesn't, or no, sorry. So here you're saying you think this one should, would ha, you would have thought this to be different, right? Yeah, no, this, this is good, this is good. But, for example, T is a key that is indexed at zero, and that should return a seven. And if you're trying to apply that operation, that flat uh, equal operation, onto that seven, it should normally work. Or, if it doesn't work, it should say that int object doesn't have, instead of tuple object, because after indexing it, you're supposed okay. to get an empty So, that's interesting. Is that what you meant? Okay, so it's the same interesting, good. Uh, just easier, not good. Uh, it's great if you both have different interesting things. Uh, what's going on here is it's not evaluating T10 first. It's seeing the, it, it, it parses the thing and it says, oh, I need to send the plus equal message to, using the old style of talking about message, uh, message like uh, object oriented. Um, uh, in a sense, it's, uh, it's gonna call, this is gonna turn into a call of the dunder i add method of, of T1. Right, and that's why it fails is because the the tuple says, "Sorry, I don't 
I can't, not only, you can call my IAD and I'll refuse to do it, or possibly, and here's what I don't remember, we might find out shortly, is maybe it's doing the syntactic sugar and it's turning it into an assignment for us, and then it's just saying, oh, you can't do the assignment. I think that's what's going on. I don't think Tuple has the Dunder IAD. Yes, Tuple should not have Dunder IAD. Uh, it, it's, it's, yes, it's translating, it's tr like when, when Python sees a name and square brackets, then an opera, and, and then an assignment, or in this case an augmented assignment, it turns that into call a method on the object, passing what was in the square brackets as one argument and what was evaluated on the right side as the second argument. That's the way it does its, uh, does it. And if anyone wants to double check me, like, I'm sure tuple does not have a dunder iad method, but check, just do a search on it. Do tuple dot dunder iad, does it say no such attribute, I hope? <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so let's, so let me go back. That was a great uh, digression. So let's look at this a little bit slower here and see what happens. Or no, let's not look at this slower. Let's, let's, do some, let's do some other code here. So here's T1, here's T2. So T2 is a tuple with a, sing, a list with a single element, which is seven. So here, this ought to fail or not. What's that? Yeah, it should fail. Ah, good, okay, so this fails. Uh, I was getting lost there, right? And so T2, and when this is all done, will be seven, right? So we look at T2 and it should have seven. <coughs> but it doesn't, right? So this is a wart. This is something where Python did something unexpected. It basically, it, it got an error, but it had already gone down the path of trying to do what you asked it to do by the time it got the error. And to roll that back would be too expensive to implement. Expensive in terms of there'd be all sorts of other features we wouldn't have because people would be still trying to figure out, oh, whatever, you, you get my drift. So let's, let's simulate this and then we'll understand why that happens, which will help us understand what's going on underneath, I think. All right, so suppose we have a list, m equals seven, and we put it in a tuple. There it is. And then we do the I add on the list, which shows it goes exactly against what I just told you. So I think I might have this wrong, but that's okay, it'll be interesting. And I'll go figure out later if I'm wrong. I think one of my two explanations has to be wrong, either this one or what I told you. Uh, and let me make sure I don't do this again. Let me see, where is that? So. Does tuple have IAD? You were looking. It does not. Okay, then I think this explanation is slightly wrong. <clears throat> um, but let's see what we can learn from it. So, is so temp equals m dot dunder iad eight, right? Is temp going to equal m? Do you remember what Dunder IAD's supposed to do? It's supposed to return a reference to the object that it changed. So this should be true. Yep, it is the same object. And we can double check that way, of course, that it is the same, it's not just that it has the same value, it's, it's the same, those are both names for the same object. And we look at that object, it's got the seven, eight, right? <clears throat> and if we look at T2, it's got the seven, eight, right? And, and this all makes sense. None of this is surprising. What's surprising is if we then try to do this, we get object, tuple object does not support item assignment. So what I was going to tell you is, this is all a simulation of what this tried to do. And it, you notice that it worked, 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 and failed down there, but by then the list was already updated. But now I'm not confident that I got that right, so. Maybe at the break I'll do a little snooping around and see if I, which of those two explanations I got wrong or if I'm still misunderstanding something. Anyone else chime in if you're ahead of me because I always learn lots from students and this would be good, another option, another opportunity. <clears throat> okay? Okay, let's uh, look at something more, uh, not more interesting but more germane to actually using Python in common cases, can functions modify the arguments passed to them? This is a common question that sometimes even intermediate people in Python are like, ah, you, uh, 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 and, and the, uh, here's how you can really tell, right? So let me, let me show you. 
I think it'll be, I think this will be clear to you, having done those other sections, right? So, does this make sense, right? I pass the string one to the test function. Inside it, it prints the one. It makes a new, oh, interesting, it makes a new name or not. So this is kind of different than the, non, the, the locals thing. But it does S plus equal to, right? So it's not really that different, because remember, there is no plus equal dunder i add method on string. So it just says, well, reassign S, which is not a local or global, right? It's the parameter. So it's a local that exists, it's like a local that existed way up here. So this is different than the non-local, uh, unbound local problem. Um, and afterwards, it's going to show up as two, right? And of course, well, what's S1? It's got to be what it was, right? You can't change the contents of a string. So it's still one. <clears throat> uh, if, if you want to double check this, you could try passing the string one. If that's confusing, just imagine if we had right here, instead of S1, we had put in one. Well, then it'd be clear that we're not going to come back and have one be something else, right? We passed something that's kind of like a constant. It's a reference to something that's immutable. Anyway, we do that just for fun. Okay, so uh, okay, so now we're going to change that to a to to what it what Python changes it into, since string has no uh, dunder iad method, and you can see that it's going to. It's going to do the same thing. Okay, so now let's try the same thing with a list. So if we do this, right? Now plus equal on a list is just the same as list dot extend. Really, it's another way to like those two functions do the same thing. Dunder i add called on a list and dot append called on a list do almost exactly the same thing. The only difference is dunder i add also returns a value. <clears throat> um, but the side effect of the same in terms of change list. So we've got this M, yeah, it's one, two, three. We call before it's one, two, three, after it's one, two, three, four, and then when we're done, it's still one, two, three, four. So my point here is I think it's clear to you why this changes it, and I think it's clear to you why this doesn't change it, and it has nothing to do with pass by reference or pass by value or any of that. It's just that when we call a function, we pass a reference to an object. Can the function change the object? It depends on the object, right? Is the object something that can be changed? A string cannot be changed, a list can. You can ask a list to change itself, insert a value, append a value, delete a value, et cetera. A string, you can't. And then once you understand that core item, then the things about how Python does its interpretation, well, of course it can't change the string that you pass into the function. And of course it can change the, the, uh, the list. Okay, so that was the end of section five. I think we have uh, three o'clock is the PM break and we are there. Perfect timing since I've been doing too much talking recently and not giving you exercises. So take a break and we come back at 3.15, then I'll move on to the next section. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep going. Got lots of more fun code to look at. So I think uh, this is a great discussion, way to push and say, Stuart, what's your, well, whatever. It was great that uh, I, I, liked, I uncovered a bug in my thinking here, I think. Um, so I think what's going on, and let's chat after if I, I'm not getting this right, and I'll go look at it myself, even if you don't come chat with you to make sure I get this right. So here's what the statement in the documentation says. The augmented assignment falls back to the normal methods, right? So in other words, here, no, not here. Oh, so here, in this one, the reason this one failed is because this falls back to the normal methods, meaning it's as though this is the code that got executed, right? And so it, it, it perhaps correctly calculates seven 
plus one equals eight, and then tries to do the assignment and it fails. And so it leaves two zero in a, in a normal state, or T1, sorry, T1 in a normal state, the old state, which is it still had the seven in it. Down here, uh, this is the same thing. This thing is supposed to be equivalent to T20 equals T20 plus eight. Well, then the question is why did it do something instead of failing? And the answer is, while it's supposed to be equivalent, look how it actually compiled. It actually compiled as in place add. Uh, now, where is the store? And then the store name, I think. So, so I, I'm pretty sure, again, I'm not going to spend the next half hour going through this, but I'm pretty sure it's that this in place add happened earlier than we thought it should. Like, I think the error came in when we did the assignment, which would be here, I think, pretty near the end, but the error happened in between. So where the document says it should fall back, well, this one, the, the code that gets generated makes sense for lots and lots of cases. In this edge case, it doesn't quite fall back early enough. So, okay, decorators. Uh, I'm not gonna teach you very much about decorators but I am going to show you the mechanics of decorators primarily and show you some kind of cool, oh, I think it's, it's kind of fun things that will, uh, I don't know, party tricks, I guess. Uh, no, no, seriously, they, I, think it, I think if you are confused by decorators and how they work, when you're done with this, you'll at least understand the mechanics of them. Whether or not you can write good ones, I don't know. I, I don't write a lot of decorators, occasionally I do. But let's uh, look at, a, a, at least at the surface, what is a decorator? Well, conceptually, a decorator changes or adds the functionality of function by modifying its arguments before the function is called or changing its return values afterwards or both. So let's write a function, def add, very complicated function that adds two things together. We can call it and it works. So here's not a decorator, but a function that, uh, here's a function that creates another function, right? So create adder, it takes an argument first. It defines a new function in here called adder, which uh, returns add of first, which was passed into it, and second, which is passed into this function. And then this function is never executed. It's only returned, okay? So when I do that, now if I say add to two equals create adder, add to two is going to have, is going to be a reference to what code object? to the closest I can point you to is that code object, right? It's what that compiles to. And so it will have in it, uh, the two right here is gonna be already sort of in the call, in, in, in the, uh, the code that gets compiled, and the second is gonna be passed in, right? So we go ahead and create that add to two, sorry. And then we can call it and add to two, yeah, does it. Adds the two that was passed in in the create adder and the three which is passed into that inner function here and it creates the five. Well, here's a, a more uh, typical decorator, right? So what's, what goes on here is, it's, I'm calling it trace function because what it's going to do is it's going to print something before and after calling the original function but before it returns the result. Of course, it has to do that. So, so it's gonna, it's gonna, here's the, the it changes the behavior before the original function is called and after the original function is called, but still returns whatever the original function computes. So that's a typical decorator. You can have some stuff before, some stuff after, or, or both, right? So <clears throat> what happens? Let's see how this works. If we pass add in, then this new adder is gonna take any number of arguments and just pass them on to the original function uh, right here, where that original function is add. We're going to do it down below. It's just going to print things before and after, but the new function is going to call the original function and return whatever it returned. So it's going to behave the same except adding some more functionality. All right, so let's uh, define this. Sorry, let's define this function and let's call that function. And so now we have a new function, new f. Down here is called traced add, and if we call traced add with a two and a three, you can see it, it, it does the call, right? It says, it does the print here, and it does the print there, 
and it returns the five. Does the print, does the print, and returns the five. So here I took the add function, passed it off to the trace function, and got back the traced add. Well, I could instead just take the original function add, pass it to the trace function, and take it and put it back in the same place, i.e. bind the original name, add, to whatever I passed in. Well, now I've, I've totally lost a reference to the original add function. The only place it's held is somewhere inside this new name, this name add that refers to that. It's somewhere inside there is a reference to it, so it hasn't disappeared, but I can't get at it anymore. And so now when I call add two, three, it's gonna do the same thing, right? Well, this syntax, this right here, is exactly what this does all in one step. Right, so that's, this is how a decorator works, is you, is you put something here. So what Python does when it sees this, and I'm not sure exactly the order, but uh, it's roughly this. It evaluates this expression, in this case it's just a name, and gets back an object, right? It's got that object, it's gonna save it. It then evaluates this def and does the, and remember what, what the def does is it creates a code object which knows its own name and has some code and then it uh, takes the name and puts it in the current namespace. So that's what it usually does. But instead it's got this decorator. So it's got this decorator ready. It then creates the code object and then before inserting it into the namespace it takes this code object, passes it off to whatever this object was, the, the decorator, it's gonna return a value, and that value is put in the current namespace with the name add, right? So it sort of it interjects something in the namespace operation in the function evaluation step, right? So you do all that, and we get just the same thing, right? There we go. Now if we look at the add function, it's kinda ugly function dunder main dot trace function dot locals dot new f, right? You see where that came from, right? Main trace function locals new f. Well, that's its name. All right, oh, where'd we go there, right? And we can look at its qual name, which is new in Python 3, I think, same thing. And it's got a doc, which is the new function. So, didn't we have a? Oh, look, I had no doc string. I should have put a doc string up there so it's clear that I dropped it. That's no good. Let me, uh, let me fix that. Uh, okay. Do, 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 do. So, so this is kind of ugly, and this is kind of ugly, and this fixes all of those ugliness. So here's the one difference between the code before and this code, is I imported func tools and I use func tool wraps. What func tool, what func tool wraps does is it cleans up those names and takes any attribute, it takes all the, I think all the attributes of the add function and puts them into the new f function instead. Even other attributes that you might just hang off a function for some reason, right? Like you can just add a, like, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, that's not a bad, that's a bad example, I won't go there. Um, so I'll do this one and I'll do the same trace. And this time, I, this time I'm putting in my, uh, the doc string so you can see. And it, same thing. And now the add says it's mains add and it's qual name is add and it's doc is the right thing. Right, so now it's got all the original things that were associated with that function, but it's got the extra tracing code, okay? Uh, so what if we want to function, what if we want to do this? So remember what Python does is it looks at the at, looks at this and evaluates it and saves it and, and it's a function. It's going to now, it's going to take this code object and pass it to this object and whatever it returns gets inserted as concat. So that means this whole thing, when it evaluates, has to be a function that I can pass a function to to get a decorated function back, right? Well, for that to work, I have to, so here's my better trace function. So all I did, if you look at the old and the new definition, this right to there is identical to my old trace function with the exception of 
this got added around it, and this got added at the end of it, and I added this one little thing to actually show some difference. Right? So now, if I call better trace with uppercase, it's going to return a function, specifically this function, which I can pass that function object to, to get back what's really going to be inserted in the current namespace with the name concat. Kind of get it? I'm seeing some nods, slow nods, and some puzzles. That's about normal. This is good. You're, you're doing great. All right, so let's try it. Can cat spam eggs? Woohoo! It worked. No difference because it didn't trigger the if. Now let's do uppercase equal true. Look at that, uppercase. It now uppercase the return as well as doing the trace. So it's the trace plus it uppercase the return uh, result. It's a very useful decorator, by the way. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Memoize is a much common, much more common example. It's, you know, basically, and you, there's no reason you would ever write this now. You would go use func tools LRU cache since it's there. Um, but we could, you know, just to show you how it works. Memoize, that's not a typo, by the way. It's not memorize, it's memoize. Uh, so, right, we'll, and you can just, you can play with this later, but basically it shows that the decoration happened. We called it to get five. We called it to get nine. And this time, we called it to get five, but we didn't call the original function because we remembered it from last time. So it's, that's what memoizing does. It's a cache that speeds things up. Uh, so note, not a real decorator treatment. This is just sort of, here's a quick thing. And now the really fun part, I think, is the exercise that I'm going to ask you to do right now. So go do this exercise and see if it hurts your brain but makes you understand decorator mechanics better, I hope. And if you want to say, ew, you're welcome to do so. How many people are done? Good. So, can I move on? Okay, so again, it's kind of a weird thing to do, but I think it, uh, you know, let's make sure that X is not in the namespace. Let's create a function that looks a little bit like a decorator because it has an F, which 
makes you think it's a function, but it totally ignores the input parameter and just returns a string, right? So if we take a function x that does nothing, there's the function, and we then say, well, let's just override x in a sense, let's rename, or let's take x and bind it to whatever return spam returns, passing it x, which does nothing anyway, and return spam, which ignores the x, we just get x is spam. Well, this does exactly the same thing, right? So you look at this and you say, like, I, I, my hope is you look at this and you go, okay, now I get the mechanics of decorators. It's just a namespace operation that moves a function through another function. Can you only decorate functions or it, does it apply to anything that's hard? Uh, you can do class, dec you can decorate classes as well. Classes. And I am not touching that at all in this content. Okay. So, ooh, there it is, X is spam. <clears throat> All right. Sorry, my screens are backwards. I keep getting lost when I move my mouse across. Okay, let's look uh, at how classes work <clears throat> and understand. Let's let's peer under the hood there a little bit and see what we can find out. Uh, yes. Uh, a use case for a decorator, I would say, is when you have. Um, some functionality you would like to add to more than one function, and uh, but you want to be able to add it. Uh, it's independent of what the function's really doing. It's sort of orthogonal. Like tracing is a good example. Memoization is another example, right? Like you can t you have code with you know your code's running slow and you realize oh I'm recomputing the same values over and over again. Just go import func tools lru cache, put it in front of some of your functions, and your code's going to go faster. Use more memory, but go away faster. Um, and, and you can do that without in changing the original functions. You don't have to modify the original function. You can even do it without changing the original code, right? So usually a decorator you put right in front of your function definition, which means if someone gives you some code, you have to go edit their code to put that in. But you can decorate manually. You can just say, well, import that function from that module, use the LRU cache, not as a decorator with the at syntax, but just as a take, you know, import that name and then reassign it to itself having passed it through the LRU cache, and then suddenly you've got, you've decorated their code without touching their code, makes your code run faster. Another example. Does that help a little bit? But uh, there's, there's lots of, again, this is, there's, I'm covering, decorators kind of interesting, but it's, it's not my primary. Um, decorators are very interesting. I, I'm just touching on them here a little bit. Other questions? Okay, uh, so what does a class do? Well, class statement starts a block of code, Right, here's a class, block of code starts, creates a new namespace. All namespace changes in the block, such as simple assignment function definitions, are made in that new namespace, right? Remember that, right? we mentioned that before, that's where namespace changes happen. And then it adds the class name to the local namespace, and the class object also knows about the name. So there's the name going two directions again. Uh, instances are, you do, you create instances that way, Dunderknit is called automatically. It's passed an instance of the class already created by a call to the dunder new method. Anyone here ever used, written a dunder new method? All right, I did once a long time ago. It's pretty rare. Um, and then, here's the interesting part. When you access an attribute such as method name on a class instance, what you get back is not a function in the class. You get back a method object, and it binds the class instance as the first argument. Blah, blah, blah. Um, that's the theory, and let's just see what all that means. So here's a simple class, which is going to be in numbers for us. It has an, a dunder init, and it has a self. Pretty straightforward. It's got a version, it's got these attributes. It's got the help, which tells you a bunch of stuff. It's got, I can, I can if I access the class's dunder init, what I get back is function main.number.init. So in this main, I've got the number class, and in that namespace, there's an attribute I can get at, which is the dunder init function. Uh, and there's a number add as well. There are two functions. If I look at, and I'm calling them functions on purpose here, as opposed to calling them methods, and you'll see why. If I look at what's in, what are the attributes in, sorry, in there? Well, there's lots of them. Some of which we've seen, right? We've seen class. We saw a dick, but that's at the class level here. All sorts of stuff. And there's the add. And no, a dunder knit was in there too. So let me just uh, define a little helper function. 
So there is the only public, as in not starting with the under, double underscore, uh, attribute of the number class. So now we're going to instantiate the number two. It has an amount attribute. Why? Because way up here, it got added. Right? Sorry. Uh, and if I look at number two, it shows me some address or thing. I haven't defined its str, its repr, so it's under str or under repr, so it's going to show me its best guess or how, how you want to describe, how you want to show it. So, uh, number dot init function main number init. Number two dot init bound method number init of main number object at, right? So it's taken number two is a reference to an instance of number two, uh, sorry, of the number class. And it's in somewhere inside it, it's got a reference to that object and it's got a reference to the dunder init function up in the class, which becomes a method, a bound method when we access it. Okay, so it's just merely accessing uh, um, uh, the attribute of the instance, it goes and finds it in the class, and therefore it returns a bound method instead of returning a function. Okay, pretty simple. There's the number two bound method. It's got public attributes amount and add, right? Well, amount, we know that makes sense, but like, like that, was, that one's different than the one on number. So, so add, it's a public attribute of it, but it actually came from the class, whereas amount is stored on the instance. Uh, and you can actually see the only difference between if you look at all, the, not just the public attributes, but all of them. Uh, it's got a dunder dict, which we saw before with the simple namespace with p.x and p.y. Uh, I think that's where that was. And then we've got this, uh, the class also has a dict, which has a bunch of stuff in it. We're going to ignore that. But we can see at least that the add function is up in there. Okay, so I've got this number add. Let's call it. It worked, how exciting. Okay, so let's try a few other things. Number add, so if it's a function, remember this is how I defined it. Inside the class, it was defined as a function in the class. If I call number add to, call the function number dot, capital N number dot add, and pass it a single parameter to, how is the code in the line above going to fail? Or will it, will it work? There is no self. Well, so the name's different. Self would get bound to two. So that's not the problem. There's no value. There's no second argument, right? So when we call it, it goes, eh, and it says, sorry, you missed an argument. Okay, so let's add an argument. And will this work? Why won't it work? Exactly. Two does not have an amount attribute. So two and three, self will get bound to two, value will get bound to three, two dot amount is gonna fail, right? Sure enough, int object has no attribute amount. Can I do this? And why will this work? Is it because number two is an instance of number? No. Yeah, so, so in this, I'm, I'm cheating here, I'm not doing it the right way. Number two is gonna work as, a, as passed to number dot add, only because it fits the bold. Duck typing says it's gonna work, right? It walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, right? It, it has the right attributes. So I can do this and it'll do what I want. Gives me the five, cool. Of course, that's the wrong way to do it. Here's the right way. Okay, so uh, there's the earlier definition of init. And I can look at that function. I can look at what it says. Cool. So let's create a new function called set double amount, which takes two arguments, which I can name whatever I want. And let's monkey patch the number class is dunder init attribute with this new function I just created. All right, so this looks a lot like the regular init, right? The regular init did self dot amount equals amount. This one's gonna say number dot amount equals two times, right? First argument dot amount equals two times the second argument. 
So it's almost the same except the names are different and it's got the two times. So I've done the nonkey patch, and so now if I sign number.init, it says function, right? And it says, okay, it's not quite as helpful in terms of, well, maybe it is, it's, this isn't the right way to do it. Number four, yes, yes, cool, it works. Bound method set double amounts, the names aren't right, but it works. And even number two, Correct. All, all the instances of number four, of number, sorry, have now, they all work. Let's do some more monkey patching. Multiply by number value, right? So this looks a lot like the add, but it uses a star instead. And it doesn't use self, it uses number, but other than that, it's okay. All right, so number four equals multiply by. So now number four has an attribute. Warning, warning. Why isn't that a bound method? Number four dot mull. Multiply by is missing one required positional argument. Well, isn't it supposed to get it from over here? Well, the answer is no. What I've did is I've got this function. Okay, so, so I've got this function that just takes, just takes two arguments and I only gave it one. Well, can I do this? That works. So the mistake, of course, you'll see if I do number 10 equals number five, and look at number 10's mole, it doesn't have one, right? So what I did is I put on number 10, it only knows about add and amount, whereas on number, it only knows about add, and on number four, it knows about add, amount, and mole, right? So I, so I put the mole on the instance instead of putting it in the class, and it fails, because when you access a function that's an attribute of an instance, it's just a function. When you access a, a, a an attribute which it has to go to the class to get, and it's a function. It comes back as a bound method. <clears throat> okay, kind of interesting. So let's uh, fix that. And now this should work, right? Good. And this should work. Oh, it still didn't work. What's going on? Why doesn't this work? Right, it's being shadowed, right? If I look at number four, it's got the same as it had before. It's got the right, it looks right, it's got the right attributes, but one of those attributes is not coming from the class, it's coming from its own dunder dict. So if we get rid of that, the shadowing goes away, the dict looks right, the public list hasn't changed, but I know that if I access the mole attribute, it's gonna get the right one now. I can access it, it says it's a bound method, I can see that one, it's still gonna be the function, and I can call it, and everything's happy. So, last little stretch here. There's the class, there's the instance, there's the function, there's the bound method. We can actually use the bound method directly if you want, like this. Remember the add to three or whatever, add to two we created with the decorator? Well here, we're making an add to two just by using number four's add. Right, it's a bound method, so you can call it. Right? it there's, there's nothing wrong with doing this because that's actually how Python evaluates it. When you say number four dot add, blah, 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 Python gets the number four, goes and gets an object from its add attribute, and that object is then the object that Python calls. So there's nothing wrong with just saving that object and calling it later under a different name like this. Right? So that's kind of handy occasionally. Number four has add amount and mole. It has a bunch of other stuff in there, including Dunder, where is it? Dunder class, Dunder call, that's interesting. Dunder new, Dunder self. Huh, so it has Dunder self. And what does, what's different between them? It's got, ah, it's got Dunder funk as well. I missed that one. So it's got Dunder funk and Dunder self. Right? So the bound method, these are the attributes that are in the bound method that aren't in the class method or function. And you can probably see where this is going, right? The self is, right? So the number four object has an attribute add, which is a bound method, which has an attribute self, which is the same thing that number four refers to. So that's how it remembers, that's how it figures out how to get it back when it needs it. And the func, of course, is the same as the class. So the func is just a reference to the class function. 
right? And you can prove that. And it's also the same across all the instances. So when I call number four dot add five, it's kind of like I did that. Number four dot add dot func called with number four adds itself and the five. So that's how classes are wired in Python. It's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, so how about meta classes? Who here has written a meta class? Oh, voodoo, crazy, magic, right? Does it, who gets scared when they hear the word meta class? Yeah, like I, I used to too. I, I still haven't written very many, maybe one or two. Um, but as part of teaching this, I'm like, ah, oh, I can figure out how that works. And I go look at it, I'm like, oh, oh, it's not that bad. So I hope to make that true for you as well. A uh, great talk at PyCon 2010, still online. Turtles all the way down, um, which is one of the things that uh, helped me understand this better. So type is a function that you've used to, you pass it an object, it tells you what type the object is. Um, you can also, it also has other, uh, through the magic of default arguments, it also has this one, name, bases, dict, and returns a new type. So when Python calls a class statement, it calls the built-in type function with three arguments, uh, right? So usually we call it this way with one argument and it's the object, but if you call it with three arguments, and I don't know what the difference is between these two, um, but when you call it with three, it actually builds it. So let's build a function, let's build a class ourselves. So let's make an init function and an add function and then we're almost done. So we're gonna call the type built-in function, giving it a name, a tuple of superclasses that it inherits from, sorry. And here are the attributes that were in the original. If you go back and you look, there was a dunder version, there was a dunder init, and there was an add, right? And you notice what was implicit is now explicit, is that number gets put into the current namespace and number gets put into the object itself. And you probably have seen that same thing with um, collections.named tuple, right? The first argument to name tuple is the same string, or should be, as the name you put it in into the local namespace with. Okay, so let's try it, see if it works. Number three, it's a number, it's got a class, it's got an amount, I can add it. Whew, everything's happy, right? Well, remember, here's the normal way. Usually you do this and Python does all that for you. It, it figures out version, init, add, puts them into a dictionary, figures out the number name, gets it into it as a string, and then figures out the list of things that get in right there in between the number and the colon the superclasses in a Python 3, objects implied. Python 2, if you want new style classes, you have to put object in. Uh, so it gets that as well. All the stuff is there, goes off and calls type. Nice. So how do you write a meta class? Well, it's just like this. By default, classes use type. Class body is executed, new namespace, blah, 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 blah. The class creation process is customized by passing the meta class keyword argument meta class keyword argument in the class definition line, or by inheriting from an existing sorry, class. Uh, and this is Python 3. Um, so here is, so all I've done here is I've put in what Python does. So there, when you, uh, so basically this is implied, but you can replace this with whatever function you want. And what would you typically do? Well, you would typically do the same thing a decorator does, as in you would do some stuff with what you were passed, you would turn around and take what you had changed and you'd pass to the real type function, the original type function, let's call it, the right, whatever name you want to have, whatever dictionary possibly subtracted or added to or changed values in, and the set of superclasses. And then whatever it gets back, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna return it. Right? So all you're doing is inserting yourself, your code, in between Python's usual, take the stuff in the class, pass it off to type. And you just can say, oh, I'm gonna do some stuff in between. That's the simplest way to think about what a meta class is, or how to, how to, write, how to write meta classes, okay? 
Um, yeah, and I mean, there's, there's a lot more, not, not much more complexity to it, but remember that uh, like this part, if I can find my mouse on the other side of the screen, um, there's this part, right? So if you inherit from a meta class, then that does the magic. Um, and the other thing that I, I, haven't, I, don't, I haven't done enough meta classes or read enough meta classes to know if meta classes are usually functions or if they are instances of classes that have a dunder call method defined. I don't know. It might be an argument either way, depending on the use case. So, oh, hey, we're back to spam. Go do an exercise with class statement. Who's done? Okay, a couple more minutes. Okay, who's done now? Most of you. 
Getting there? One more minute. One. This one I want to sort of give you time to make sure you have a chance to get it. Okay, I'll walk through this now. Uh, sorry, the, uh, some of you, those of you who downloaded the handout, does it have what I have, or does it have return five? The one you downloaded or the one you got off the thumb drive? Okay. Does anybody have return spam? So some of you do. So when you downloaded it, the notebook has the right stuff. The HTML has the right stuff, maybe. The Pi PDF might not, and the one of my thumb drives I passed out had the old version. I changed, made some changes last night, so sorry about that little glitch. Um, and even in here, you can see I talk about return five here. Um, so I shouldn't, shouldn't change the meaning here. It's just you have to use different types here is the only difference in different names. So this, uh, this is my new type function, right? It takes three arguments, which are, you know, the, uh, the name of the class and the tuple of base classes and the dictionary of values of, of the namespace of the class itself. And I'm gonna, all it's gonna do is say that it got it and then return, it totally ignore them and return other than printing them and then return spam, right? So if I call it, so I define it and I call it, then I get spam back. And if I say X equals that, well, of course I get X equals spam. That's nice. So then in Python 2, so what I quoted above was Pyth was talking about the meta class as a keyword argument. In Python 2, it's a dunder meta class attribute. In Python 3, it's like this. So I'm going to create this class Y, right? So what's going to happen is return spam is going to get called with the name Y. No arguments because it doesn't explicitly say any super type here. Uh, so type must also take that as a default. I didn't, wasn't sure of that, but now I am sure. And then it's got this, oh, here's some extra stuff. So dunder qual name, dunder module. So it actually, there's some other attributes here that I didn't tell you about that get put into a class by Python before it gets passed off to the type function, right? And then whatever, so, so those things get passed off to the type function, and because meta class is this, this type function, then what gets inserted into the local namespace with the name Y is whatever return spam Returned, which of course is spam, and fair enough, right? And then the second piece here is just uh, mentioning decorators applied to functions. Someone said, can you do it to class decorators? Well, here's the answer, right? Right, so same, same kind of thing. You put it in front of the class. It just, it's gonna, so, so basically a function, you can use a decorator in front of a class, it receives the class, does whatever it wants to before and after, modifies it possibly, and returns it. Yes? You don't like spam? <laughs> uh, what's an actual use case for a class decorator? Oh, for a meta class. Any, see all the people who could really answer that question, most of them are, are like three or five or ten years beyond this class. And several years beyond me. Uh, I think, uh, Django uses meta classes and models sometimes. If you really want to accept the functionality. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Anyone else have some good examples of meta classes? That's a great question. I'll have to. I'm here. I'm curious now. I, I've seen them in the past, but I don't remember them. Sorry, I don't have the handy. Any other questions? Did that help? Is anyone less afraid of meta class now? I hope a little bit. Okay. Um, I mean, it's still like when you get down to the, the nitty gritty of actually writing one, then it's just like, it's like, you know, write a factorial function. Right. Now you could write a meta classes, but it's still going to be like, oh, okay, I got to think what's going on with the names, what's going on with the types, what's going to, and, and worry about all sorts of stuff like what if I'm inheriting from something else? Like if you go look at, uh, like I've looked at some pieces of code where people have written, you know, meta classes, and I'm, I look at it and I go, oh, yeah, okay, I get 20% of that, the other 80%, I would never have thought it, you have to do all those things to work in all the cases and still work correctly. It's kind of like the funk tool wraps, right? It's like, oh, right, when there's an error, this traceback's going to be confusing. 
Well, we can fix that. So it's just, it's, I think much of the work of meta classes and decorators is fiddling with all those details where you have to know lots of other parts of Python really well to make sure you get it right. <clears throat> that's the theory anyway. Okay, I think that's the end of this section, right? Yes. Oh, I see what I did. Um, 25 minutes. I'm just going to mention, yeah, I'm going to mention these briefly. So you, you've seen these various, uh, you're familiar with some of these, um, and I just sort of wrote them out. Like here are all the ones that I, and, and this, uh, again, this I may not be completely update for the newest version of Python. I don't, I don't know that they added any, but I might. I might have missed some, but this is generally what you get. Here's what you can play with if you want to write a class or a subclass and change various things. Lots of container stuff, numeric types, reflected operands when you're, uh, when the order of like a binary operates the, others, the other way from your type. In place operations, unit arithmetic, bool, context managers. Um, let me, we're gonna just give you a couple examples of how you would use these, right? So here's an example that uses dunder get adder. How many people have written? A dunder get adder? I have once or twice. Really, again, it's the kind of thing, what's the use case? I don't know. A year from now, sometime in the next three years, you're going you're gonna to run across some case for like, oh, I wish I could, oh, I can do that. And, and that's what it was like for me with the dunder get adder. I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. Why would I use that? And then I ran into a use case where I'm like, oh, perfect. And suddenly I knew what to do, right? So have it handy in your toolkit. And when it shows up, then you'll be, just, you'll be like, this is amazing that I can do this in Python. I mean, you can do it in other languages too. Like you can do this kind of stuff in Java. And if you go look at that talk I mentioned, the turtles all the way down, it's hilarious because he shows you just the tip of the iceberg of what you would have to do in Java to make this work. Um, whereas in Python, it's, well, not simple, but it's a lot easier. So all I'm going to do here is get adder, dunder get adder is the, at, is the method that will get called if Python looks up an attribute and gets an, and would be about to raise an attribute error. But before it does, it says, well, before I raise an attribute error, let me check to see if there's a dunder get error defined on this object. And if there is, I'll call it and let it handle it, right? There's another one called get attribute, which is called always before it even gets a get attribute error. That one's trickier to write because you gotta make sure you don't get into a recursive loop. And there's a set adder as well when you do sets. Um, but get adder is a, a good one when you, when, uh, is an easy one to, to use and show how it works. So what am I doing here? Well, so I, whatever, so if I say, well, let me show you how to use it, right? So that's, uh, that'll make it more clear. And then we'll go back and look at the code, right? So let me create one of these. I can look at its dict and it has nothing in it. I can create an attribute just on the fly. And an attribute is there because when I added the attribute, it got stuck into the dunder dict. And now if I access dot foo, instead of returning an attribute error, instead of raising an attribute error, it's gonna give me back. If I lowercase, lowercase, uppercase, uppercase. Don't ask me what the use case for this is. There's not a good one. Uh, but it's easy to do, right? It's, it's self name, right? So get adder is just, well, what name did, you, did, they, did the caller try to look up? So I get that name, I can check. If it's uppercase, uh, then check to see if the lowercase is in self.dict, and if it is, uh, look in, take the uppercase name, make it lower to look it up in the dict, and make it uppercase and return it. And then this part's really important, because if you don't do this, you're gonna be able to try to access lots of stuff and it's not gonna work right. Like you want it to fail, um, instead, it'll be getting none instead of getting an attribute error. Um, because none, because it'll fall off the end of this function and, and return none. Every function returns none if it doesn't, at the end, if it, if it gets that far. Uh, so, just to double check, does d.baz raise? Yes, good. All right, so there's a simple use of, of get, dunder get adder. Um, specific behavior, you can add uh, attributes for properties. So, I want. In this case, uh, I want to, if they access the attribute X, this is a more controlled and much simpler to use than dunder get adder. Um, so I want, if they ask for the X, I'm gonna give them dunder, uh, sorry, single underscore X, the hidden one. If they set X, like I'll, I'm doing nothing here except instrumenting it. So all it is is add a print, add a print, add a print,
And I think that's a typo. Why would I have that? That looks like a typo to me. So I never noticed it. Maybe I had some reason why I put it in before. Anyway, you get to control, right? So you say at property, and you put it right in front of whatever function you want uh, to be the attribute name. And then once you've got that, you use its, it gets a setter property that is also a decorator and a deleter property, which is also a decorator. It's kind of cool syntax. Um, and it's just going to, uh, and obviously the point of this is not just to instrument it to show you what happened. Uh, the purpose of it is to actually do something with this, right? And there's lots of reasonably good use cases here. When someone accesses an attribute, maybe you're making it up or going to get it or caching it or who knows what. So we can uh, make this work. It's pretty easy. Here's my property. You can see it's got that underscore x. This is going to drive me crazy. <clears throat> uh, and so now if I access p dot x, it shows me the underscore x. And if I set it to bar, it shows me that it called the setter. And if I access it, it shows the getter that called it, and the delete. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's because I wanted to go back to in, un, initialized. Um, right, so not a big deal. So, uh, and, and of course, if, uh, you, I assume, all know you shouldn't be writing setters and getters on your methods, on your classes. If you need them, you can add them later with property and hide the real stuff. Uh, Here's an exercise for you to try. So take five minutes. We've got about 10 minutes total. So I think we have, I can give you five minutes for that. Maybe. Not quite. No, I need, I need all 10 minutes. I'm going to stop you right there and say, I'll just show you what happens. Actually, no, this one, uh, this one I will let you run on your own. It's fairly straightforward. It's kind of cool. There's nothing terribly crazy that will be hard to understand there, except maybe that when you pass something like this, the only thing to, that will help you if you get stuck is to know that when you do something like that, the colon colon two, Python turns that into a slice object, slices a type in Python, and passes that object off to Dunder get item. So that's sort of the one thing that you would learn new from there. So let me uh, go through this a little bit quickly. <clears throat> oh, and I forgot to change those. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, just a quick uh, understanding to make sure you understand how iterables, iterators, and the iterator protocol work. And those of you, a couple of you I saw this morning, this will be review because I did a similar treatment. Um, so a for loop, it evaluates an expression, calls iter to get an iterator, calls its dunder next method, or just calls next the function on it, and just keeps doing that until the stop iteration is raised. So when you see that, it's as though that happened. It is, that is what happened. Is behind the scenes, that's what actually happens. And this makes it easy for you to write your own iterators if you need to. Um, anyone written their own iterator? Yeah, good, a couple of you. Um, again, I didn't think uh, it'd be kind of fun why would I do it? And then I came into a use case, I'm like, oh, perfect. Wrote it, and it just made the client code so much simpler. Again, it makes, it, it's complex code, but it's where it belongs. You put your complex code in a library that's well-tested, lots of people review it, and it's all right there in one place, and then all your client code gets a lot easier. That's, the, uh, that's when these features are nice, are useful. Uh, we can call it manually, and you can see the same thing happens without calling the dunder next. Right is left. <clears throat> uh, by the way, next you can pass it with a second argument, which is kind of cool. So here, it's not going to raise a stop iteration. It's just going to return this. So it's kind of like a git for a dictionary. Um, so what does the iter function do? Well, it calls, it checks to see if there's a dunder iter. If, it call, if there is, it calls that to get back the iterable. Uh, sorry, the iterator. Um, if not, then at first, before it fails, it says, well, let me check to see if there's a dunder get item. If so, I'll call that instead, starting at zero and counting up. So here's a very simple little list. It's going to take whatever you pass it and store it. And when you get it, it's going to tell you it got called and return it. Right? So we'll define this. And you can see if I call get item, there we go. A, B, and index error. 
right? Of course, here's usually the way you would do that, A, B, and index error. You don't call get item directly, you usually use the square brackets. Uh, does M have a dunder iter? No, but it has a dunder get item. So if I call that, then iterator is going to call the get item, I suspect, with zero and one and two. And when it gets the index error, it's going to raise a stop iteration. So there you can see what it's doing. So that's why we get iteration over sequences for free without having to do any extra work, uh, adding iterator stuff to them all the time. Um, and list M, same thing. There's how it goes. And there's usually the way you would call it is in a for loop or something like that. Uh, these exercises, I'm going to skip. Nothing terribly new there, except this one's pretty interesting. This one might, and this one might make you sort of wonder what's going on. Uh, generator functions. How many have written generator functions? A lot more of you, as I expected. Generator functions are very popular, as they should be, right? Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know how they work, basically, it's like a function that you, um, whether I described it uh, earlier this week to someone, is it's like uh, if I go to someone and if you ask me, give me the numbers from one to one to three. No, you give ask me for that. Give me the numbers from one to three. One, two, three. Here you go. Whereas a generator is say the same thing. Here's the one. Here's the heck one, here's two, and here's three. That's the difference, right? And, and I, like, instead of me doing all my work and then handing control back, I hand him a data back and then I wait. And then he, oh, you forgot, say give me four. Or something, right? At some point, I give you one, three, one, two, three, and then I should raise stop iteration when you ask me for the next one. And then the for loop works on the other side. So that's, that's uh, an easy way to think about those. And here I've just put, you don't usually see a bunch of yields, but you can do it that way, and, right? Um, Next, next, next. So let me, uh, so here, limit, no. I'm gonna skip this part and let you do it on your own. But let me show you. So the nice thing about generators they, is they, uh, the best thing about them, I think, is they're simpler to write. Meaning the code is cleaner, right? If you look at this even one, and it's a lot cleaner and shorter than even two but they are used typically exactly the same way. Like not quite exactly, if you, if you were assume it's returning a list and you check its length, for example, well even two is not gonna give you a length, you'd have to convert it to a list first, but it's just easy to write and that's true for long generators that call other generators. I've done a fair amount of that and it's just made it way simpler using generators than not. Um, uh, of course the other thing is generators can compute an infinite stream of things, well, potentially infinite, and as long as you keep asking, they'll give it, you know, compute all the primes. Compute all the factorial numbers. Um, give me back all the network traffic that hits this port. And just keep giving it to me until it never stop. And it doesn't have to put it all into memory. Or in some cases it can't because it doesn't have it. Or read from a, you know, a file and do some filtering on a file as you read it. And the file is bigger than memory. Well, all that stuff will, will work easily with generators. Another simple example, some exercises. The last thing I want to show you in three minutes is just a, just a summary, oh sorry, sort of an overview of, <clears throat> of, of, uh, just an overview of some of the ways that you can, some other ways to take advantage of first class objects and how to bind data to objects. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm almost out of time, three minutes. I'm gonna skip that one, it's kind of an interesting example. I'm gonna show you this one. Uh, and th this one is based on some code that I did write where we had a bunch of fixed record length files as in uh, thousands of them and or tens of thousands of them of 50 types where each one had a clear definition of what the various offsets meant but they were different for 50 different types of files and we got tired of you know writing custom code to read each one we thought why are we doing this why don't we just write a generic function that you can create, so we did. Um, but suppose I have these Python releases and I want this code to work, right? I want to be able to say, uh, given one of these releases, create a release 
call the release field call the release fields method. Uh, sorry, class as in instantiate an instance, create an instance of it, and then I want to just be able to access by name, by version, by date. Right. Well, here's version one, which works fine, but it's kind of verbose. Here's version two, which is more complex because it has all that, but adding a new property is as easy as, or adding a new attribute is as easy as adding one field with the offsets. And this, we actually didn't even do it this way. We actually had code that went and read a documentation file and pulled it in and created this for all these 50 file types, right? And so it's just using get adder and a data structure of slices, and it works the same way. Also passes those tests, okay? And also does a uh, fails correctly. Uh, and then the last bit here, uh, just I want to give you an overview. We, classes and bound methods and decorators do this kind of thing. They bind data with functions. And I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the various ways you can do that in Python. Um, here's a simple example, right? I've got a simple function that just, if I say log warning, this is a warning, or log error, this is an error. Well, I could just create a function called warning that calls log warning and binds message, right, into message to message. We saw that kind of binding in decorators. And now warning as its own standalone method with a single argument does it. Uh, and here we see a more generic way to do the same thing where we have a function that returns a function. So warning two is create logger warning and then you can call warning two and it does it. You can create a partial function and in func tools, there's a partial, right? And it actually, you can see how it hides, how it wraps stuff up in there. And so you can call that and it just works. Bound method, I showed you the add to, I think, bound method, the number two dot add. Uh, well, you can, you know, here's an example that says, okay, I wanna figure out punctuation, super simple. Well, so if I, it's a sentence if the last character is in this string, is a substring of that string. Right, so I can do that in, but I could also do the same thing that way, right? So in, there's a dunder contains on the uh, on the sentence punctuation object. So if I just, you know, I can if I just take that dot contains method bound method and give it a new name is end of sentence. Well, then I can just call it directly. Is that end of sentence? Is that end of sentence? Uh, Right? So then I could call that instead of uh, doing the in. Not a great example, but I'm just trying to stretch your mind here. And then here's another example. I can use create a class with a dunder call method. How many people have done that? A few, right? So uh, if, uh, I find this very useful occasion, uh, quite often. Um, a third, maybe a quarter of the time I'll, I'll do this instead of the alternate of a, uh, of other ways to do the same thing. Um, so this one's pretty popular with me because it's, it's just easy to think about it. So I have a class, it has a dunder init. Instance of the, instances of this class, you can call like their functions. And when they get called, this is the method that gets run. And the only advantage to doing that over a function is they get to access whatever instance attributes and class functionality you've stored in that little nice tidy uh, piece of code, which is the class, right? So I define that class, and then I say is end of sentence dot one, right? And then I can check, and uh, is end of sentence, this is actually checking not just the character, but the whole string, the whole sentence, right? So that's true, that's false, right? So dot ends it, but exclamation point doesn't. And then I can change it and say, well, let's make it something like this, is end of sentence with any character, and then you can say, yep, that's true and that's true, right? So that's the, the done recall is very useful. I, I use that more than I think I would have predicted as I start to I just keep finding it the easiest way to write something that's really clear. Um, and then you can also do this. Uh, this is an unusual thing to see, a print inside there, but watch what happens. 
So do you see that the print up here got called at evaluation time when the function was defined, and this print got called when the function was executed? This is a well-known gotcha. If you put like an empty list up there and then you modify it in the function, the next time you call it, it won't be empty, and that's a bad thing. Well, but you can use it to your, it, it's usually a bad thing, but you could, uh, you could use it to your advantage if you want. I, I wouldn't recommend this, but in theory you could do that. And just create a little counter every time he calls. And we're out of time. I even kept you over a few minutes. Sorry about that. A few more examples. And please remember to do the survey. Uh, if you hang on. Oh my god, I'm sorry. We go to 440, not 420. But now I've run past all the things that I could have done more slowly. Let me think about this. Well, I'll just go here and then go back. I apologize. Um, don't forget to do the survey. Pop it open right now so you have it ready. Uh, if you, one of the reasons, let me rephrase this, um, not assuming you enjoyed or learned from this tutorial, but whatever you did learn from this tutorial, part of it is due to people last year and the year before who gave feedback on their survey. So please return the favor, pay it forward to the people for next year or wherever else I give this, but give feedback. Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Are there things that were especially confusing? Um, be nice to have a survey that says, you know, tell me each one was it confusing, because that would take you hours to fill up. Uh, so let me start by saying, are there questions? And then I can go back and do some of the sections I skipped. Anyone have questions or comments? Okay. So, now I'm, now I'm totally off. What did I skip that would be, that I should not have skipped? I was, I was feeling bad because I thought, you know, oh man, I tried really hard to trim it down to be about the right length. <laughs> and it turns out I did. I think what I suggest is go back to the... Please choose one of 10.3 exercises, binding data with functions, or the iterator... Uh, or generator functions exercise. So the three sets of exercises I just skipped over, we don't have time to finish all three, um, but we have about 14 minutes. So go take nine minutes and do as many of those three that we just skipped as you want in sections nine and 10 of those three exercises. Um, and then when that time is up and it's about in about seven minutes, seven, eight, in eight minutes, then I'll go through all three and explain, okay? Or leave if you want, that's fine with me. Thanks.